Well, hello, I'm Josh, and I'm back once again for a little less formal video this week. I'm not talking about one specific film this time, but instead I'm actually talking about multiple films. And as you saw in the title, all these films are in the Criterion Collection. As many of you have probably picked up over the last year, I am a pretty big fan of the Criterion Collection. And if you happen to not know what they are, they are a company that specializes in making, I guess you could call premium Blu-rays or DVDs, generally of more obscure or hard to find movies, and restoring them along with putting a lot of effort into bonus features and artwork, and overall just releasing it in the best way they can. Also including essays which go over the historical and cultural context of the film, all to show why they are giving this film this kind of treatment. And in doing so, this is not not only to give a great version of the film for fans of it, but also to hopefully introduce younger audiences or people who haven't heard of the film to the film. And they've actually been doing this since the 80s on Laserdisc and then switched over to DVD in the late 90s and then to Blu-ray in I think the late 2000s. So yeah, very popular company with film fans and filmmakers, and they make excellent products. The only real drawback for most people being the price. Yes, at retail value, these guys can be pretty expensive. Now I do feel that in just about every case, these films are worth what they're priced at. They definitely fill them up with bonus features and commentaries, and as I said earlier, really good artwork, as well as presenting the film itself in an excellent quality. But unless you've got a lot of money lying around, these can be a little hard to come by, especially in the amounts you want to get them in. So to kind of counteract this issue, Criterion has four 50% off sales every year. Two of those being online on the Criterion website and then the other two being at Barnes & Noble stores. And so if you are a Criterion fan, you've probably caught on to the fact that one of those Criterion sales is going on this month of July. And scouring the internet, you can find all sorts of pictures of people with huge stacks of movies that they've picked up over this 50% off sale. And granted, even with these films being marked down 50% off, most people are not going to be able to walk out with 15 just stacked under their shoulder, but it does allow for them to get one or two of those items that are a little too pricey at full value. So anyways, I've been seeing a lot of people go through their picks for some of their own personal favorite Criterion films or ones that they would recommend, and I thought I might do a little one of my own. I've collected several over the past, I guess, five years I've been collecting these films. And so I wanted to put together a list of some of my favorite Criterion editions. Now this is not necessarily my favorite films in the Criterion Collection. That would be a pretty hard list to do, but instead I wanted to do some of my favorite Criterion releases. So this is taking in not only the films themselves, but the quality of the release and the value you are getting for what you're buying. An example of an earlier film I did would be Night of the Living Dead. If you remember seeing that video, then you know I talked about how much I like this uh, Blu-ray. Even though the film itself is in public domain, I really think they brought a lot of value to this particular edition. Just with the tons of bonus features, it's got two Blu-rays inside. So it's got very cool artwork, as you can see. I'll just set it right there. And, um... Yeah, so this, I'm not counting it in my list since I've talked in pretty good extent about most of these and other videos on my channel, but uh, this is kind of the example of what I'm trying to go for with these. So, a really good release. And so to start off my list, I'm going to be talking about not one single film, but instead kind of a collection of films in this set called the Golden Age of Television. And what that is referring to is back in the 50s, a lot of companies produced these live television plays, which were basically these small films that were done live and blocked and shot as if it were a standard film. But still they kept the energy of the improv and the rolling with mistakes that theatrical plays had. So it was a really interesting period and a ton of great artists emerge from these kind of productions. Nowadays, they have similar things happening every now and then, like 
I remember they did Grease live and I think Peter Pan live, maybe even the Christmas story live. But these were much different. They had a new one produced every single week and often the directors and actors would work on a cycle of a new one every about two weeks or three weeks. But again as I said many of these are very interesting to watch as several of the people working on them ended up going on to having very successful careers in Hollywood. I mean just in this collection you've got Paul Newman, Andy Griffith, Rod Steiger, Mickey Rooney, you know, very big names. And along with actors, several famous directors came from this as well, like Sidney Lumet, John Frankenheimer, Franklin J. Schaffner, and along with the actors and directors, several famous writers emerged from this as well. Probably most famously Rod Serling of the Twilight Zone fame, but along with him another big name is Patty Chayefsky. He actually wrote Marty for one of these programs and it's actually on this disc. And that's one other thing you'll notice. Several of these films or episodes that you'll see on this actually went on to become feature films. Like for example, they also have Bang the Drum Slowly on here which in the original broadcast was Paul Newman but went on to become a feature film that starred Robert De Niro in one of his early roles. And what makes this actual set great is they've compiled several of the most famous or more popular episodes of these shows and have compiled them on three discs. So it's a really cool set. Each film has a about 20 minute introduction to it that was produced by PBS back in the 80s and it features all the original actors, directors, writers in the interviews talking about the film, what it was producing it, as well as the impact that it had. So they're really cool to watch and if you get this and want to see more I can definitely recommend checking out some of Sidney Lumet's. And Criterion actually includes some of these on the bonus features for several Sidney Lumet films like 12 Angry Men and The Fugitive Kind. And probably my favorite of those being the uh, one called Tragedy in a Temporary Town. That's really good. It's got Lloyd Bridges in it. And as far as this collection goes, I have to say probably my favorite in the set is Requiem of a Heavyweight. I remember that being pretty good. But uh, the comedian is also really good. That's a John Frankenheimer one, who if you don't know, he did the original Manchurian Candidate along with many classics. And I also love their production of No Time for Sergeants, which is Andy Griffith in one of his first roles. I think this might have been his first TV role and then uh, of course Face in the Crowd was his first film role. But yeah this is a very good collection. I can definitely recommend it. It's pretty cheap from what I recall for being three discs. I will say some of you who are interested only in Blu-rays will be disappointed this is only in DVD at this point. But that being said, these films when watching them are not really in high quality. They were shot live and if you've seen any live television productions back then, they don't particularly look good. I mean they're made to watch on very small televisions and from what I understand the way they were able to record these were through a method called kinescope I believe. They basically took a monitor which had the live feed of the production and they basically just filmed that with a film camera. I'm sure they had to get the frame rate on the camera set right, but as far as I know, that's how they were made. So obviously not the best quality or necessarily preservation. Definitely in the 50s, preservation was not really thought of, especially for TV programs. So it's understandable why these don't look or sound particularly exceptional but Criterion did the best they could with what they had and that being said if you don't want to get it because it's not blu-ray and it's not the highest quality I will say it's probably not going to be the highest quality anyways but I'm still hoping they'll eventually go the blu-ray for this anyways moving on talked quite a bit about this one so I'll try to go a little faster next one I'm talking about true stories if you're a fan of talking heads and you may be familiar with this, it's the one and only film that David Byrne, the lead singer of Talking Heads, and I believe lead writer too, he uh, wrote and directed this film called True Stories. It's very wild, very wacky, very crazy, as well as being very funny. And after watching it, it's kind of surprising that David Byrne didn't try and make any other movies. He's definitely got a style to him and a particular eye for 
what he wants to see. Definitely making this film very unique. As I said, I love the visuals with this film. And as you can also see on the cover, it is an early film of John Goodman as well. He plays this kind of country cowboyish character, and he's really funny in this. And uh, he sings a song at the end, too, so that's always fun. But the film's also littered with several somewhat famous names that you might notice and be surprised that they're in, like uh, Spalding Gray is in here, and the pop staples of the Staple Singers is also in this film. So it's a pretty interesting film. The music is great. If you like the Talking Heads, you'll definitely like this. But as far as the Criterion release of this, I say this is probably one of my favorites. As you can see, it's in that nice uh, digipack, I think they call them. And it's inside, if you check it out, it's got a CD with the soundtrack. And this, I believe, is the first time that the actual soundtrack from the film has been released. In the past, if you got the True Stories album, it was just the band doing their own version of the song. But in the film, the, all of the songs are actually sung by the characters in the film. So this time you can actually get the tracks as they are heard in the movie. So that's pretty cool. And then I also loved, since the movie is kind of going into tabloid culture and all these weird news stories that you read in the newspaper that are considered true, and that's kind of where the concept of the film comes from. And so Criterion decided to put their essays for the film in this kind of tabloid newspaper presentation, I guess you could say. And so, like I said, it looks pretty much just like an actual newspaper, so it's really cool. Oh, there's uh, Jimmy Dean there. But yeah, definitely one of my favorite uh, additions. It's just got a really cool art style to it for a film that already has a really cool art style to it. And the film is pretty hard to find otherwise. Uh, I think it was only on DVD before this, and probably in not a great manner, so... Definitely can recommend this if you're at least someone interested in Talking Heads. It's got a little bit of a Coen Brothers vibe to it, especially with the John Goodman being front and center there. And so my next one, I have to go with Ernest Hemingway's The Killers. Now this may look like just a normal Criterion disc from the outside, and it's only got one Blu-ray, so I might throw you off, but this has a ton packed inside it. If you look closer, you'll see this is actually two adaptations of Ernest Hemingway's The Killers. The first one being the classic film noir version, and the second being more of a neo-noir 60s version. And so to fill you in if you don't know what The Killers is, The Killers is a short story that was written by Ernest Hemingway. And so the story is basically these two hitmen who walk into a diner and are asking around about this one guy that they're trying to kill, basically. And the story is basically just this intense encounter between the store owner and the killers. And so as I said, the first movie is a classic film noir version that came pretty soon after the story hit, I believe. It's got Burt Lancaster in, I believe, his first film role and um, Ava Gardner as well. And it's this very gritty classic film noir. It's probably one of the best film noirs if you're into that genre. The lighting's on point, heavy shadows, it's just great. And so what they do is they start the film off with the short story pretty much line by line the same. And so then they leave the cafe and kill Burt Lancaster. And so the rest of the film is basically the detectives figure out what happened and what's the backstory to all of this. So it's a really good way to extend this short story. You can cut it off at the uh, initial night when it happens and it works just fine as a short film, but the rest of the film is very interesting as well. I guess it's technically not Ernest Hemingway, but you know, it's still a classic film noir, so definitely recommend that version. And so then if you look, they have the 60s version as well, which was directed by Don Siegel of Dirty Harry fame. And he's definitely a well-known gritty director. So he brought a lot of interesting things to this. It was initially made as a TV movie. So the lighting, if you look, is pretty flat, I would say, throughout the whole thing. Kind of bland looking. It looks pretty much like your standard 60s TV show. But since it has Don Siegel helming the film, 
it is much more than just a TV movie, I would say. It's got tons of great actors like Lee Marvin, Angie Dickinson, John Cassavetes, Ronald Reagan, of all people, as well as Clue Gallagher. And this film actually takes the story from the original 40s version, so the kind of extended storyline, and kind of reverses the perspective of it. So instead of following the detectives like you did in the 46 version, you're actually following the hitmen. Because after they killed John Cassavetes, Lee Marvin's character just can't get out of his head why they would kill him. And so like I said with this film, the killers are actually backtracking their steps and figuring out what the mystery is behind it. And on top of that, you also have a short film adaptation directed by Andrei Tarkovsky. You know, normally you think of Tarkovsky as in like Ivan's Childhood, The Mirror, Nostalgia, you know, these really heady films with these beautiful visuals. He's always very poetic, so it's kind of interesting that he would do a gritty kind of crime drama. And so, like I said, I feel like they packed a ton in this edition. And if I remember correctly, they actually include the original short story narrated by Stanley Keach. So you're pretty much giving every single version of the killers ever produced. So they're not kidding when they say Ernest Hemingway's The Killers. They, it comprises everything, really. But yeah, definitely good value considering it's pretty much priced like the standard Blu-ray. So you're pretty much getting three, three and a half movies in one. So definitely recommend this if you're looking for Criterions. Next film, all right. His Girl Friday. Now this is another classic 40s Hollywood film. Great performances from Cary Grant, Rosalind Russell, tons of character actors that are amazing. It's Howard Hawks, so the writing's on point. And I could definitely recommend the film just on having the film His Girl Friday. But Criterion took the extra mile and they included the newly restored 1931 version the front page. And so if you don't know, His Girl Friday is actually an adaptation of the front page, which was written, or I believe co-written by Ben Hecht, who was a pretty big name in the classic Hollywood era. His name comes up again and again. I believe he's referenced, he might even be uh, portrayed in the recent Fincher movie, Mank. But he's a great, really funny writer, probably best known for the original Scarface. But so anyways, he wrote the front page as a play kind of a send-up tribute to his days at the newspaper. And so the story, if you don't know, is about the relationship between the newspaper man and his boss. And the newspaper man is leaving, he's getting married, and the boss basically uses this recent event of a hanging, which is largely due to corruption with the sheriff. And so the boss basically uses these events to keep their reporter on the newspaper. And so the original story actually has two men, but Howard Hawks saw that it would be interesting to uh, switch one of the men's genders and turn it more into a love story. So that's where His Girl Friday comes in. And of course, it's a classic screwball comedy, one of my favorite stories. But the fact that they include the original front page really makes this a worthwhile deal. And I will say when I first got this, I was not really expecting too much from the front page. You know, I heard it was slower. It's obviously not Howard Hawks doing it, though it was Lewis Milestone, who was a pretty well-established director in his own right. But so anyways, I was not really expecting too much style or really interesting visuals from this. I mean, it's 1931. So for those kind of films, you kind of go in knowing a little bit what to expect from a comedy from that era. And not that the writing won't be good, but visually, they're pretty locked off. There's not a lot of movement aside from moving left to right or maybe up and down. But if you've seen Singing in the Rain, you might remember that the post-silent era, I guess, in the early 30s was very difficult for sound recording because they were having to use these big microphones and disguise them in different areas. You didn't have the uh, shotgun mics on the boom pole like you do nowadays. But so anyways, to make a long story short, was not expecting too much from uh, the original front page. I remember hearing a uh, Peter Bogdanovich interview where he said he had heard that it was slower and not nearly as interesting as His Girl Friday. So I have to say, when I put in the movie, I was blown away by 
just how inventive and visually stunning that movie is. There is so much camera movement in it. I was just stunned that they're tracking around the table. Uh, they're moving inside the table. They're doing whip pans and stuff. I was not expecting any of it. So I was really caught off guard, very pleased by the original front page. And on top of that, the writing and acting is excellent too. But what kind of explained why the 30s film was pretty popular back in the day, but after His Girl Friday, it was kind of seen as a lesser film, was actually the original US print of it was lost for quite a while. And the way they would get around cutting different versions for different countries back then was they would actually shoot the film multiple times and then use the best take for the American version where everyone would see it. And then for the international version, they would use their next best take. And then like another version, they would use the third best take. And so the American version, which had the best takes of everything, was actually lost for a long time and was only discovered somewhat recently in what I believe was Howard Hughes's aircraft facility or something. I can't remember exactly, but yeah, so the version that people have been seeing pretty much since the 40s was like the third best take of everything. So it kind of explains why people weren't quite as interested in the movie after it came out. In fact, the uh, version that was at the Library of Congress was actually this international version. Anyways, I can definitely recommend His Girl Friday in the front page. Next one. Jackie Chan, Police Story 1 and 2. Alright, so many of you probably know Jackie Chan, if anything, from the Rush Hour films, which are all really awesome. But we're actually Jackie Chan's second attempt at having a Hollywood career. Back in like the late 70s, early 80s, Jackie Chan also did several movies in the US, and he was seen kind of as a Bruce Lee knockoff. I believe he was in one of the Cannonball Run movies. But so, anyway, so he returned back to Hong Kong kind of upset and decided to kind of prove that he knew what he was doing and he could be a really good action star. And so he decided to write, direct, star, and uh, sing the title song for a uh, movie called Police Story. And so this is an action staple. It's got great stunts, very dangerous stunts, uh, not unusual for Jackie Chan, but uh, some of the stunts, particularly the ones in the shopping mall, Jackie Chan said he does not think he would ever attempt again. So that can give you kind of an idea of what kind of crazy stuff he does in this. But anyway, the first one is a very excellent action film, action comedy really. It's got some great slapstick with it, as well as some great stunts and choreography. It really shows a lot of dedication on Jackie Chan's part as well as just the talent he has as a comedian. You can tell he takes a lot of inspiration from some of the silent comedians like Buster Keaton or Harold Boyd. And so I can definitely recommend the first one as well as the sequel that comes with the set as two, Police Story 2. And you know, most sequels are not quite as good as the first one. And I guess if you're talking strictly on set pieces, I don't think anything in the second one surpasses the first one. You don't have them doing anything like sliding down that giant pole in the shopping mall. But this also has some really great set pieces as well, like the one in the playground or at the restaurant. They really show a lot of creativity and humor as well. But I really like the uh, story in the second one. I think they bring a bit more of a mystery to it. There's more of a focus on the narrative, whereas the first one was a bit lighter on the narrative and more focus on setting up the next big action set piece. Since it was filmed so soon after the first one, it actually has the full cast is back and it also calls back to the first one several times as well. So it makes for a really good double feature. And on top of having the two police stories, the bonus features are excellent as well for this film. There's tons of ones analyzing the film. I got a really good interview with Edgar Wright. And on top of that, there's also a really good documentary that Jackie Chan made that kind of breaks down how he choreographs fights and how he blocks the camera around them. And it really just gives a good background on what he does. It's really cool to see how he breaks down his fight scenes and how he shows which angles are best for which kind of movement or whatever. And most of all, I think it's a pretty good resource for anyone that's interested in filmmaking. 
probably specifically with fight scenes, I guess. But uh, really, it just shows his kind of eagerness to make movies and to perform. So I can say definitely a recommended item. And to top it all off, another thing people like to get during this time where it's 50% off anything in the Criterion catalog a lot of people choose this time to get box sets. And these sets often comprise of four, five, six, even more films. at still a pretty high price, but way cheaper than it would be to get a retail value. But so anyways, the box set I wanted to talk to you about is the complete Jacques Tati. He was a French kind of comedian filmmaker, a little bit like Charlie Chaplin, but he was known for making these films that were not quite silent, but focused much more on visuals and uh, sound effects than they did on talking. And he was a very creative, very funny filmmaker. And he appeared in all of his films, many of them as this character, Mr. Hulo. And Mr. Hulo was this character that was pretty much silent. He would talk every once in a while, but the films comprised of him moving around these areas and almost observing the comedy and so as the audience we kind of observe the comedy that happens around him and oftentimes it is created by him as well you can think of him a bit like a french mr bean but so anyways this collection actually includes as it says in the title all of his films granted he only made six but it also includes all of his short films as well which there are several of those. I mean, it's not every day you can have a filmmaker's entire filmography in a box like this. So I think on that basis alone, it's pretty cool. But the films themselves are amazing as well. You might recall a month or so ago, a YouTuber, Video Game Donkey, actually talked about one of these films, Playtime. And a lot of people were surprised that uh, a channel focusing mainly on video games would talk about a... Uh, a classic French comedy. But I thought it was pretty cool the fact that he kind of gave a spotlight to this film and in doing so bringing more people to Jacques Tati who on top of making very funny films is also just a very influential filmmaker in general. Tons of directors like Martin Scorsese, Edgar Wright, uh, David Lynch talk about how much they uh, take from Jacques Tati and how much they appreciate his films. So yeah, definitely if you are interested in comedy, specifically visual comedy or physical comedy, this is an excellent place to start. The thing I love about these box sets, this one in particular, is that it allows you to look at this filmmaker's full body of work in this case, and you can watch the bonus materials and really learn about him and grow a uh, understanding of the director. And as I said, you can watch his entire filmography. So yeah, really cool set definitely recommend it and yeah i hope you uh look into all these films i've uh, recommended for you i don't know how long this video is going to be i have been rambling for quite a while about these movies that i love but anyways i really appreciate you guys that have been hanging with me and uh listening to what i have to say about all these films and so i'm wondering if you want to get into the comments section uh you can post some of your favorite criterion editions any of these uh you want me to talk about in further and some maybe my uh you need to watch series as well as maybe some of your favorites that you would like me to talk about and also just what do you think of this kind of video i i wanted to put something out that was maybe a little quicker to edit since my normal videos are taking a bit longer to do i'm trying to spend more time in the editing a little bit just try and pump up the quality as i go on and in doing so with work and everything it drags it out a little bit more and also i'm still working on that short film i've been telling you about for several months. So yeah, I decided to kind of uh, try out this kind of video more, uh, me just rambling about movies I love. Not as much research going into it or making cool transitions with clips and stuff. So anyways, if you like this video, hit the like button. If you don't, you can hit the dislike button as well. I'm Like I said, I'm trying to figure out what you guys think of this kind of video. Subscribe if you want to see more of my videos and be sure to keep watching movies. Maybe I don't know, check out one of these films I've talked about today. But anyways, I will see you later. I hope you have a great rest of your day.